And the only reason I know it is I was actually lucky enough a couple of weeks ago to be hanging out with uh, the lead investigator in this case. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our first podcast. On this episode, we interview Mr. David Feld. We discuss everything real estate fraud related. That's from the different types of real estate fraud, who these people actually are, how they get their information, and how they get away with it, plus what we can do to protect ourselves. If you find this informative, please subscribe, share, and give it a like. That way, I'll know to continue to make more content just like it. Thank you so much, and enjoy the show. During the 1930s, the housing market collapsed nationwide by roughly 80%. I mean, half of all. Uh, Moore's debt was in default. And I mean, there were very specific identifiers, extremely recognizable. I mean, for instance, the, one, 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 one of the hallmarks of mania is the rapid rise in complexity and the rates of fraud. And did you know that they're going? Welcome to the podcast. Um, I haven't really created a name for this. This is the first episode, um, but um, I'll introduce myself. I'm Brandon Hebert from Berkshire Hathaway and the Atlas Maverick Group. Um, maybe we'll call it something like the Realist AMGs podcast. <laughs> pretty cool. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Some fun like that. Um, I thought like there's there's this social media. Um, kind of post that seems to be going around about fraud and fraud seems to be such a big kind of topic right now. The owner of a condo in Toronto is warning fellow property owners not to fall victim to fraudsters after her home was sold without her knowledge. That instead of doing some sort of random green screen and discussing it, I thought I'd go to the professionals and straight to the source. And so um, that's that's you, David. Um, so welcome. Welcome to the podcast. Um, for those of Thank you who don't know David, um, he's my go-to real estate lawyer. He's done all of my own personal transactions and he's always a referral for all of my clients who are looking. Um, and what's great is that, you know, if I ever have any questions, I can always reach out to David. So I thought he'd be the perfect person to kind of discuss all of this with. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, I appreciate you having me here and it's nice to, to be on a podcast. It's been a little while. Uh, um, I want to wish everyone a happy new year as well. I know it's been a rough last year for a lot of people, so I hope everyone has a great new year. I'm David Feld. I'm a real estate lawyer in Toronto. I work alongside my wife and an amazing team of passionate lawyers. Uh, we have an amazing firm, We Are Law. We close thousands of deals a year. And yeah, lately with everybody being forced into their home due to COVID-19, uh, the frauds and money down due to you know interest rates up, we're starting to see a little bit of uh, increase in fraud. So fraud's been on the rise and that's what you're starting to see in the news as well. And that's why probably we're having this talk right now. Well, I mean, what kind of fraud is there? Like it, that that's just one aspect of it. Like where tenants are, or like what, how much fraud is really yeah. out there? So there's a lot of fraud out there going on every day. I think what we're going to talk about today is more real, real estate fraud. And even within real estate fraud, there's a lot of different kinds of fraud that goes on. So for one thing, there's a lot of fraud going on. So if you are looking for to get insurance, you, you can get uh, fraud insurance as well. And you should look into that. People are stealing people's identity and just getting fake credit cards and doing things like that. That's a form of fraud as well, right? But let's just stick to real estate. Um, as you probably know or can imagine or you hear in the news mostly, the most common type of fraud is, is mortgage fraud. That's where, you know, a fraudster, a frauding fraudster poses as someone else. And they, like, we'll, we'll get into it a little more, but they pose as someone else and they do all the things that that person would do, except when they get the money, they leave the country or they send the money out of the country uh, to wow. somewhere where it's hard to get. Okay. So that's the most common is just mortgage, flat out mortgage fraud. Okay. Another kind of fraud is uh, where the where the faking fakester uh, sale sells the property. Okay, so they they're to an innocent buyer. So that's, what that's we kind of hearing. the one we heard. Yeah, so they you know they get uh, I'll get I'll tell you how they do it in a bit, but basically 
uh, they, they, they take the property and sell it to someone else. Okay. And that person just for, so, you know, is buying it in good faith. It's an innocent buyer for in who's acting in good faith. And it's an innocent purchaser for value. It's called like they literally are using their hard earned money to buy the property as well. So it's something to think about. So the next thing is a title, a title transfer by a fake homeowner to a fake buyer. And that's where, and by the way, as I'm getting deeper into these, you don't hear about these that often. And it takes many layers to get to go deep and do something like this so yeah. that's why you don't hear about it but people do uh you know again usually with fake id that's typically how all these are done uh, from a fake homeowner to a fake buyer okay so that's something that that we see and then uh another one is uh a, a common one it, this is as we get deeper into the fraud scale but a mortgage broker or mortgage person is involved in the fraud and they basically apply a different mortgage than was promised to the client so much so that they receive huge sums and things like that. Now mm. that leads us really to elder fraud, which is a big common thing is that the elderly uh, are taken advantage of one. They don't usually have a mortgage on their home at some point. So they have a mortgage free home. It's very, it's easier to commit fraud on a mortgage free home. That's one reason Two, they don't read their emails much and all that. So maybe by the time they receive paper documentation about some mortgage that some fraudster made, that fraudster has already taken the money on their home uh, and, and it's already over the border and it's long gone. Okay. So for uh, people prey on elder people all the time, but when it comes to property, it's, it's more most common that you'll see it was to someone elderly. Okay. Okay. So those are the kinds of fraud we see in real estate. Okay. Well, how are they like, so who are these people? Are they tenants? Are they just random fraudsters? Are they like, how do like, how do they get the information? Like, I, I don't quite understand where they would, how they would even start this whole process. Is it overseas? Like, you know what I mean? Like we all get those terrible calls. <laughs> I've gotten those calls and those emails and I have a funny story, which I, I won't get too much into, but one of those calls I got was real and it turned into one of my best referral sources. And it was from a, a country where you would think it was all fraudulent and all that stuff, but it was amazing. So anyway, um, who it is in the GTA, and I'm lucky to know the answer because most people don't actually know the answer. And the only reason I know it is I was actually lucky enough a couple of weeks ago to be hanging out with uh, the lead investigator in this case. And so uh, he can't d- disclose much, but I can say a few things uh, that that he, he can say a few things. I can say a few things. You mentioned you're the good news on a board. Is, yeah, I, I'm on an advisory board uh, for this kind of thing, for fraud. And uh, so I get to hear about this stuff. And I have stories with fraud that happened to me at the very beginning of my career, which were very scary. So I'm very alert to to fraud and, and that. So anyway, um, in the GTA, it's about five big groups that are doing this. Okay. And so that's the good news, meaning it's not 20, it's not 100. It's very sophisticated. They are extremely organized. Um and the leaders are never seen in this, okay? So you don't see the leader of these groups as being the dude who bought yeah. the property or sold the property or any of that stuff. It's You will never see the leaders, okay? Uh, what they do, and again, I just lucky enough to hear about it, is they will pay stand-ins approximately 10 to 20,000. And these stand-ins are people who need money desperately. They may be on drugs, all different kinds of things. And they give them a story and they give them the fake ID and they give them everything they can and cannot say. And they train them and they pay them 10 to $20,000 each time they do this. And wow. if they get, don't get caught, great. But if they get caught, well, they go to jail. Like the leader just moves on. Okay. So, and it's happening more and more now because lawyers actually don't meet their clients. I mean, one good way to stop fraud, and I'm sure we'll talk about that, is to meet the client. Okay. And they don't do that anymore. No one does. You can do full transactions now without it. And everyone loves that, right? We all love the idea of closing transactions as fast as possible, moving on to the next one. And and realtors are guilty of that because especially now the times are tough. Realtors want to take whatever deal comes. Lawyers want to take whatever deal comes. Banks want to take whatever deal comes because when's the next deal coming? So the motivation to look the other way, and we'll talk about that in a minute, the motivation to just close deals is very high for all parties involved. Yeah. But so that's who they are. You also asked, how do they gather information? Okay. Yeah. By the way, this is not a lesson for fraud artists. Like, my, this is a lesson <laughs> yeah, that, for us. That, yeah. People are writing down, uh, okay, first we get they this. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, 
man, that's some scary stuff so far. Like, uh, I didn't think it was that high up of an organization that like kind of creates this whole process for people to kind of fall into. That's nuts to me. I thought it the was the reason just- why we would know what it is when we catch the people, we find evidence. And so we see how sophisticated it could be or, or was or is only when you catch them. So that's, that's the interesting part. Okay. Uh-huh. How do they get the information? So one, they'll go on to Terranet, TerraView, MLS listings. That's one way to know. Okay. The second is they'll, they'll look at Airbnb rentals and they'll say, okay, maybe the owner hasn't been there for many months. So that's a good one to do. What you're trying to do, what they're trying to do is figure out what is a good property to prey on? Who's a good person to prey on? Okay. They'll look at, they'll create fake property le- list leasings. They'll do leasing, fake property leases. Yeah. Uh, they'll recruit paid sources in banks. They pay off federal and government, government, provincial ministry departments like the MTO. I'm just telling you some examples of things that really have happened. Okay. Wow. They steal identity, purchase it on the internet. There's ways to purchase these I- perfect identity on the internet. You can buy it. They steal mail to get uh, personal information and they do surveillance on vacant properties. So those are like some of the main things you'll see. They do which on vacant properties? Sorry. Surveillance. surveillance. Like they'll literally okay. just watch it. You know, and I've seen that too. I've seen burglaries where people have surveilled properties for days. So imagine similarly, you could just surveil a property for months and say, okay, they're not home. No one's home. Yeah. Okay. Wow. So that's how they're, yeah, so that's how they get, it. that's mostly how they get the information. Sorry about that. So I guess the next kind of question is after they've done all that and they've kind of gone through this process of actually swindling somebody, how do they end up getting away with it? Because like as a realtor, I know that I'm, you know, doing due diligence and following up with people and there's a whole fin track process and there's also a lawyer and there's also a mortgage broker and they're all involved. And like the people that I work with, I don't think anybody is fraudulent in that nature. So I don't see it. I, I'm just maybe naive about it, but like how, how are they getting away with it? Because there's so many layers. So the good news is they're mostly not getting away with it. That's why we're not hearing about it. It's, it's mostly not happening. It's very hard to get away with it, especially when it involves multiple parties working together. It's very hard to get away with it. However, a few people get away with it and money talks. They must be paying decent sums to people to allow this to happen. The good news is from what I'm learning from the investigators that we talked to, they are able to track it. They do figure it out. They do get to the bottom of it. They do catch the people. It's not like they don't catch them. They 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 have ways to figure it out. And so it's few and far between, even though the news will always blow it up and will blow it up by these kinds of podcasts and things like that, But um, which we should, because we should educate people and how to be vigilant and things like that. But they do get away with it. They present well. They do use fake IDs and fake documents so much so that the average person, the average realtor, the average lawyer, the average banker would just let it go through. So, I mean, there are things we should talk about and I I, I can tell you some things if you like, um, but there are some things we should do uh, in order to protect ourselves. Us as lawyers, us as realtors, us as just normal people doing normal deals every day because this is these this fraud is on the rise not just in real estate but all all across the board that really was my next question was like well how do we go about protecting ourselves because as far as i know it's always been title insurance so that somebody can't necessarily sell you know it's insurance right is but what is it that you need so good news is there is title insurance and it's mandatory. Everyone who purchases any property in Ontario has to get title insurance with the transaction. Their lawyer must get it. So they do have it and it does cover for fraud and things like that. So that's good news subject to an investigation and where it doesn't show that you committed the fraud yourself. Right. Yeah. Um, because that, could, that kind of stuff happens too. So <clears throat> the, for, okay. Other than title insurance, which is very important, and, and like, there's a question that you ask yourself with title insurance. Let's say title insurance, and in this case, I know title insurance covered both sides, both the purchaser and the seller. What's the best resolution, right? Should the sellers get their home back that they lost, but they haven't been in there, let's say a year? Or should the purchasers who currently live there with their three babies and the nanny, uh, and they've been living there, let's say for three months, let's just say, just to give some fake facts, who should have that property? Like it would, our, the sellers would be like, well, obviously it's us. We've had it for 25 years. It's our family home. Like 
that's everything to us. And then, and then the buyers are like, well, we renovated the whole place. It's our home. We've been there for three months. My kids go to school here. Um, my mother just moved in next door. Um, so the question is, you can't split it in half and you can't make two of them. So somebody will be given money as damages. And that's how insurance works. Money give uh, Insurance gives money for damages. They don't build you a new home. They don't get you a, an uncrashed up car. They just give you money to fix the damages, right? Yeah. So it's still emotional. It's still all these different things. So how, we want to protect ourselves from it happening at the beginning. So how do we do it? By being vigilant, by looking for some red flags. A few red flags are one, a rush to close. People who are fraudulent are always rushing you. They're always in a rush. They're not laid back. So just watch for people in a rush. You don't need to be in a rush. You know, if you're in a rush, if I I have a thing in my firm and in my life, actually, I learned this at a young age, but when anyone's rushing me, I immediately slow down so much so as to annoy that person. So if someone rushes me, I will slow down to annoy them and I will watch so carefully their behavior at that point in time. Okay. I learned everything I need to know in those few moments of me slowing it down so much that they will get annoyed, but I will see why I need to understand. Why are we, why are we annoyed about? So you as the lawyer or as the agent or as whoever you are in the deal, you need to be easy and slow. And it, the, the flow of the deal should go the way all your deals go. If you ever feel like the flow of your deal is not going with the flow, then maybe you better go. Like you may, you're going to have to look into it. I'm not a rapper, um, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Anyway. So Check, check. One, so two, one, just two. watch for people who are rushing. <laughs> Do you rap too? <laughs> I know I'm about to. Um, <laughs> yeah, another thing is cell phone burner. They use a burner phone. Okay. They The phone number is wrong. Okay, so they might have two cell phone numbers, which is weird. If you ever see two phones on them or two or two numbers they give you, that's weird. You, you might want to contact the actual owner by cell if you're detecting something. And if they pick up and it's not this person... That's one one indicator of fraud. Okay? okay. Also, the email address will be incorrect. So, cell phones and email addresses are incorrect for fraudsters. Okay. Also, photos. Uh, when you're looking at photos on their ID, it won't be the same photo for their driver's license and passport. If they're committing a fraud, sometimes it's the same photo they keep using, but it wouldn't be the same because they applied for them at different times, and they pl- one was federal, one was provincial, and they took photos in different uh, dimensions and different things. It's not the same photo. So, if you're seeing the same photo, that's bad. Even the same signature, if it's identical, it's a little weird, although they're pretty close. Wow. Another thing you should know, and nobody knows this, on the back of your driver's license and the front, there's a black line. I don't know if you have your driver's license on you, but there's a black line there. If you look very closely at the black line, it has your name on it over and over and over again. The black line is made up of your name. Cool. And they out. don't do that on their, on their copies, so they could just have a black line there. I don't know if the you printer's saw... printer's so fine. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. But it reminds me of the, like, there's this guy who wanted to buy a property from the States and he sent me his California driver's license and there was like spelling mistakes on it and stuff like that. But like, I feel like he, he must've been giving it to multiple people in the sense that, and not gotten caught by this time, but it's such an obvious thing just to look at some of these details within a driver's license that, you know, it should. that's, That's the real deal. That's the really what I tell my team and what I tell my kids and what I tell anyone who's willing to listen is to be actively engaged in what you do. And if you someone gives you ID, don't just say, okay, I'll take a copy. Cause these days we just take a photo of stuff and it's like, okay, I have it. Like you don't even look at, it. no, look at it actively and actually look at the person. I always say, look at their photo, look at them in that one second. If they're a fraudster, they're going to feel that guilt. You're going to see something. Okay. Like we do that. We look at them. I look at their signature in front of them, not to say, I don't trust you, but to give this little like stab, like, like to say, Hey, is that really you? Cause if, you? you know, and then yeah. Yeah, something like that. So just be vigilant, be actively looking at documents. And I always say this to my team and I'll say to you actively looking for fraud, not looking to confirm it is the person looking to confirm it's not the person. There's a different mentality. Look to confirm that this is a fraud. And if you can't confirm it's not a fraud, then it's a legitimate deal and you go forward. That's the way you look at things. Okay. Wow. So another thing that I was is expiry date of the license is always the birthday. So when you look at the license, look at the expiry date, it should match their birthday. If it's, if it doesn't, it's not incorrect. It's not real. Yeah. All right. 
Oh, and That's then lastly, awesome. trust, trusting your gut. Just trust your gut. Sometimes you're doing a deal and you're like, something's up here. Something's up here. Ask questions to do your due diligence. Ask questions right to the client. Exactly what your question is. Get the lawyer involved. Get other people involved. Say, hey, does this seem right? It may not be right. You don't want to get caught up in a deal like that. Sure. Because I had once this happened to me many years ago, and it, it takes many months to get your name off of a deal that has that goes ugly or south. Because then they, they'll look to you as well to say, hey, was it you? No, it wasn't me. Oh, okay, good. We're, we're cool. But you have to go through that. So it's very scary. So you don't want to ever get involved in a deal that goes south like that. Wow. Okay. Is is there anything else? <laughs> like it seems like oh, that's everything covered a lot. Yeah, that's that's it's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, and well, then in that case, I would say you know thank you so much. Like thank you. I, I don't want to take up any more of your time. Like, um, but you know that that was great. Very informative. Um, for for those of the people watching who who don't know where to find you, can you kind of let us know where we can contact you? For sure. Um, first off, you can email the firm. Uh, all of us, my team's amazing. Info at wearelaw.ca. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram at David the Feld, at David the Feld. And TikTok, same thing. People, a lot of people know me on TikTok at David the Feld. I'm there too. I'm more crazy there, but you can have fun and see what all my little crazy antics there. Awesome. Um, thank you so much again. And, um, I think, yeah, if there's anybody who has any questions or uh, has any other topics that maybe we can cover, please feel free to comment below and um, we'll we'll put something together for another show. Thank you so much again, David. I really appreciate it and have yourself a wonderful day. You too, Brandon. Good seeing you. Bye-bye. Okay. Ciao. The Realist AMG's podcast. <laughs>